bandwidth for this week in startups provided by liquidweb.com. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Use the promo code TWIST5 when signing up to save 10%. And by Trada, the leader in crowdsourced online advertising marketing. Today on This Week in Startups, we've got another serial entrepreneur turned angel investor, Steve Chen, one of my old friends. Uh, we've done a lot of things together. He's a tremendous talent in terms of as, uh, as an entrepreneur, but also as an angel investor, he's been just crushing it. He's with us today to explain all the details about raising money and being an entrepreneur. He sat on both sides of the table. He knows what he's talking about. Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing, amazing episode. What it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups, the name of the program. This Week in Startups. It is what we say it is, and it will always be. A show in which we feature entrepreneurs, angel investors, and the people who are trying to make a dent in the universe by creating something that delights consumers, be it enterprise, be it storage, be it mobile, be it social, be it mobile, social, blah, blah, blah. With me, of course, Tyler Crowley, my partner in crime. How are you doing, Tyler? Hey, Jason. I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I feel like since we got our NPR-style microphones, the show has been taken to another level. Yeah, it has. How was your weekend? <laughs> I went to the uh, rummage sale down in Venice. And oh, yes, the art walk and yeah. then the rummage sale for <laughs> gay and lesbian and trigender dogs. And also for one eye. It was like everything is so sponsored today. But there was a big artwork by Google down there. There was, yeah. I didn't go to it. Did you go to that? No? I saw, no. Why, why go to anything? Everything's on Instagram and Facebook yeah, these days. Yeah, it's like, days. oh, wow. Just I just, sit at I, home. It feels yeah. like you were there. Yeah. But a great, the great artwork down there, and I guess Google's making its presence felt here in uh, Southern California. Yeah. Big office. Yeah, it's a beautiful office. Hey, we've got a great guest today. I'm also bringing him into the discussion. Mm -hmm. discussion. Steve Chan is with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we've known each other now for five or six years, yeah. and we met back in... I guess 2007 or something when at you TechCrunch were 50. at TechCrunch 50, the second year, second year. of second the year. conference, and you were doing Go Planet at the time, which was a startup that online travel planning. Right. Yeah, we basically help you create, generate your itinerary at the click of a button. And it was like really one of these first data normalization services yeah. that really actually worked. And uh, we're going to get into that. And also, you've become an angel investor and yes. a restaurateur. And a restaurateur. You are like the Jay-Z of the <laughs> internet industry. Like, uh, I'm going to do everything. <laughs> When's your album coming out? Uh, you know, next month. Okay, next good. Month. Hey, and one thing you're not going to wa want to wait for is Squarespace. You use, it, use Squarespace at all? Not yet. Not yet, but you will. Uh, maybe for 5A5, your amazing uh, steakhouse in, um, or, yeah, 5A5, right? 5A5. 5A5. I always think A5A A, or A5A. A. No, yeah. it's 5A5. 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 Amazing uh, steakhouse in... Uh, uh, San Francisco. But uh, Squarespace, 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 what an amazing service, 24-hour support for creating beautiful professional-looking websites, and they've just come out with a new lower and simplified pricing plan. These guys are really in the entrepreneur's corner and really in the corner of all small business and uh, website owners. Purchase a yearly or bi-yearly plan and get your free domain name, and your domain name is your identity, so make sure you own your own name. Of course, Caliganis.com. You own SteveChen.com? I don't. I have a feeling there it's might be Steve, another one. There's a couple of Steve Chen's in the world. There might be a couple. Yeah. <laughs> is, Chen, is Chen like in the top 10 last names? It's like in the top two, I think. Really? You know, Chinese last names. It's sort of like being a Kim or a Park yeah. in Korean. Exactly. You know, just like, wait, are you Korean or Chinese? Chinese. You're Chinese, Chinese. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, Chen is Chinese, yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's some Chen. Is there Koreans, Korean Chen's? I've never heard of a Korean Chen. I've never heard of Korean no? Chen. No, I've no. never heard that. I knew that was Chinese. I mean, I know it's Chinese, but I thought there was. You're some thinking Chen. Cho, maybe? C H O, that's Korean. I do know Steve Cho. There's a there's a lot of Cho's out there. Anyway, you need to own your domain your own domain name, and Twist listeners will get 10% off using the code 
TWIST5, T-W-I-S-T, and the number 5. Go to squarespace.com, especially if you got like those relatives or friends who are like, oh, I need to get on the internet, I need a website, I don't have one. Or like you're graduating college and you don't have your own website, your own presence on the web, this is the perfect place to do it, to look super professional and put all your thoughts and your resume and all that stuff out to the world. Or if you're an artist and you want to share your photos in a very professional way on your own domain name, Squarespace is so easy to use that your mom, your dad, your cousin, your brother, your friend at the gym, whoever, they're going to know how to do it without having to call you constantly. All you have to do is say, go use Squarespace, and then they're going to think you're a genius genius for putting them in touch with such a flawless, seamless product. And the way this show works is we will only take advertising from products that Tyler and myself use and that we enjoy and that we stand behind because we don't, we, listen, I've made my money already and Tyler's in the process of making his money. We don't even need to have advertisers in the program. We love having advertisers in the program because who we, we, we have to be able to get behind the product. And that's worked so brilliantly. It hasn't for the show. It has. We've never taken a sponsor that we did. Well, it was one time that I don't want to, you can't, I can't really talk about when it doesn't work out. It was like one, only I think in the history of the show, dozens of sponsors, literally dozens. Only one time did it not work out. We got complaints from users. And I had actually used the product and had a di dissimilar experience. And the product kind of degraded over time. But, and we never invited them back as a sponsor. But other sponsors, it's just like every single time we have delighted customers. And as a sign of that, Tyler's going to give you his MacBook Air. Yes, that's right. You heard it right. If you sign up uh, your, with your email confirmation from Squarespace, just email that confirmation email you get from Squarespace. Just hit the forward key and send it to contest, C-O-N-T-E-S-T, -E at thisweekend.com, contest at thisweekend.com, contest at thisweekend.com. Send us your um, sign-up email from Squarespace and We'll give you Tyler's MacBook Air. Well, one of you will get Tyler's MacBook Air. No, Tyler bought a brand new MacBook Air, and he's going to share it with you guys. All right, let's get back to the program. Thank you, Squarespace. Everybody thanks Squarespace on their Twitter accounts. Um, so just a little bit about Steve. Um, blah, 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 blah. Go Planet at TechCrunch50. That's where we met. Now, what happened with Go Planet? Yeah, it's still, it's still going. Still going, and it's people still, are addicted to it. People are still using it, yeah. Yeah. On there. It's, I think the premise was basically we just try to create everything for you at the click of a button right. from there. So that had a lot of people start gravitating towards using it, just to try it out at least. Yeah, and yeah. it was so brilliant when you showed it on stage. It was the year after Mint. Yes. And Mint, I think, had a big influence on a lot of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in 2006, 2007, 2007, I guess, time frame, 2006 time frame, yeah. where you could seamlessly sign up for a service, give it all your information, and, got, and you got something great in return. Yeah. And Go Planet, in a way, had a similar feel to it, or people said that at least. Similar, yeah, very similar. Our UI was in part constructed from at least how easy it was to use Mint. Yeah. There. And so we kind of like patterned some of what we developed our uh, technology from based on that. And, w and what was it about Mint that you think was so special and that had an impact on you and other entrepreneurs and still does? Uh, ease of use, yeah, and just the, the information that's just basically shot back towards you without you having to go, and, go out and look for it. So. And so the way Go Planet worked, when you showed it to me at least, mm -hmm. was I get my itineraries from five different places, and mm -hmm. I just forward them to one email address, uh, and I get a beautiful itinerary back. Yep, it worked a little bit differently as well, uh, yep. the first iteration of yep. it. You'd basically just sign up, tell us where you're going, and press a button from right. there. And we would basically create your I entire itinerary, right. you know, put it on a calendar, very Google or iCal-esque, and then just start plotting it out with like distance algorithms and like... What are some of the top things to do in a particular city you're going to? We take from like your previous history, things mm -hmm. that you've done, and think that, okay, if you like going to 585 Steakhouse in San Francisco, maybe you'll like STK in LA or something like that right. on those lines. And so you wouldn't really have to do any work. We would just start pulling back information and saying, this is what we think you'll like. And you'd say, yes or no, do I like it? And how has the business done since then? Has it done well? Has it done amazing? Has it done moderate? I mean... The first few weeks after launch were great. Yeah. But until the whole economy started tanking. Tanking, and then it yeah. became a little bit rough. So then it became a little more challenging. Right. right. I forgot we had the whole financial crisis yeah. in the middle of that. Yeah. And now you see how angel investing and the market has come back so much stronger. What do you take from all that? You know, I think uh, everything definitely has its cycles. But yeah. I think the strong companies kind of make it out, even out of the bad times. Right. You know, from there. As we saw from the first dot-com bust, which I was around for back that was like early 2000s. Yeah. Like, uh, 99, 2000, market yeah. crash in 2000, yeah, and then 9-11 in 2001. A lot right? of companies out there, and then, you know, they're still, the strong ones made it out, and they're even, they came out even stronger. Google. Yep. 
Doug, double click, although it traded hands a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Priceline, perhaps the biggest example. They were trading yeah. on pennies, and now they're just this they're huge, killing it now. crushing it yeah. company. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now, it seems like just the time between the second year of the conference and now, the idea of starting a company has become so much easier. Why is that? Why are so many more people doing it? And at that time, we had a hard time finding 50 people to go on stage <laughs> who actually had a good enough product. Yeah. You did. Yeah. But as Tyler remembers, it was very hard to find qualified people. Sure. Um, and now we're flooded with too many people who want to launch. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what's changed? I think now it's just uh, it's part of the culture as well, but just it's so much easier to start a company, you know, from in terms of uh, capital and uh, labor you know, on there as well. Um, so along those lines, I think that you know people are just going, start getting an idea and just starting companies left and right. And access to capital, uh, with the increase of angel investing, it's a lot easier to raise like your initial fund of a few hundred thousand dollars versus before uh, when angel investing wasn't as as commonplace out there. Yeah, it was like when you okay. raised the round for uh, Go Planet, did mm -hmm. you raise an angel round for it before? We raised through friends and family. We raised yeah. about oh. a little over half a million. But really from close friends, literally no. friends and family. Literally friends and family. So it wasn't like there, there was no angel list at the time. There yeah. was no open angel forum. There was no way to just find angels. You literally went to friends and family and said, this could become Google or I'm going to lose your money and Thanksgiving will be awkward forever. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Pretty I mean, that really sucked at that time. Yeah, it was difficult on there. And now, I mean, angel list has been great. You know, it just changes everything. Yeah, it changes the world. It's one of the, I think you mentioned, it's one of the top two most important companies in the Valley right now. I think, I think... Kickstarter, I would argue Kickstarter and AngelList are the two most important companies right now. Yeah. I mean, just what they're enabling, uh, and Kickstarter as well. I mean, have yep. you been following the Kickstarter phenomenon? What are your thoughts on that? I have a bit on yeah. there. I think with the new the new bill that's been passed, I think it's going to, we're going to see where that takes them. It's going to be interesting. Kickstarter, yeah. I don't think, will do the equity thing, but I'm pretty sure AngelList will have to, because somebody else will if they don't, yeah. and then it would be a potential threat to them, so they would have no choice. How, how many companies have you, Angel, invested in to date? Um, and we invest in both brick and mortar as well as internet companies. Oh. So, do you have a fund as such? Is there a name to the fund, or is it just Steve Chen? It's just money. A, a bunch of friends. Ah. Yeah, a bunch of different friends. Uh, right. Some of the investments I do myself. Right. And they're more angel investments, but right. some of the others we we uh, partner with other friends and acquaintances right. to do. But we're probably at about maybe fourteen to sixteen right now. Wow. I would say. Yeah. And and how many do you do a quarter approximately? What do you have a target range to try to hit? No real range. I think as long as the companies are good that are coming through. Yeah. This past, uh, I'd say quarter, probably looking at about six companies. Wow. Yeah. So a little bit more just because of the deal flow from the launch conference. Yeah. And, and you invested in two or three of them. Two from the launch. Two. Conference. From, which ones did you invest uh, in? The two winners. <laughs> ah. Space Monkey Space and All Tuition. All Tuition. Right. Yeah. Space Monkey was the 1.0 winner. All Tuition was a pivoted yep, company that exactly. was the winner of the 2.0 competition. And I, I just uh, was down in the valley and mm. ran into the founder, one of the co-founders of uh, All Tuition, and they've, uh, they've moved to the valley. To Sue or with Sue? Sue. Yeah, she, Sue's great. Sue's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And you just get that sense, uh, is, don't you, when you're, I see your eyes light up, when you, when you meet an entrepreneur who's yeah. got it, yeah. do you just know? And you're just like, I have to back this person? Or does it take getting to know them for a while? What's your experience? Like you know, some of the experience? companies I, I decide within like a five, 10 minute conversation. That within, quick? That quick. You're five, 10 minutes in. And yeah. what, what are the things in those cases when you take a minute to think about it, when you're in one of those meetings and you're five minutes in and you say, God, I just feel like writing a check right now. What is it? Take uh, me through it. Take me through a situation where that happened. Sure. Uh, Space Monkey. For really? Instance. Yeah on there. Uh, I was one of the jury members at lunch. Right. And then as soon as they started presenting on stage, I was like, okay, you know, this, this product. And they, they hit all the points that I was looking for. And I bas I bought one of their well, demo products within, I think, the first five or ten minutes. When they oh, started really? On stage. So you said there were four or five points that they got. Yep. Let's walk through each of those. Unpack okay. them. Okay. What, what was it? The team. The background of the team. Ah. On. They're, they're all in the space. They know it well. They worked at Mosey previously. Yep, so they had worked at storage at an industry leader. Exactly. So that does what for you as an investor? Uh, it adds a lot of credibility right. and, and also more faith into the, to their team and being able to execute on that. So, so in a way, if I don't have experience, domain experience in a vertical, mm -hmm. I, there's no way I can score that point with you as an angel. It's more challenging, um, but it's, it's still, 
I wouldn't say there's no way you can score the point as long as you can talk your way that you've done the research, you've done you know the background checks, ah, nothing else. So right. there's a little bit of a hack. So if I'm coming yeah. to you with the Space Monkey idea, I've never worked in storage, mm-hmm. but I just come out and say, hey, I've never worked in storage, but I've talked to the, you know, I've done these research, I've talked to these analysts, this is what it costs, this is what each user Dropbox spends on mm-hmm. EC2 to service them, and this is what Dropbox spends, and this is what Jungle Disk spends, and this yep. is what this person spends. and So just a massive amount of research could build some level of credibility, exactly. yeah. but not the same. Not, not the same. Definitely not the same on there. So I guess another hack would be, if you were starting a company, mm-hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, Tyler Crowley has no, um, you know, experience in um, storage, but he goes and finds a co-founder who does. Yep. Then they get that checkbox for big you. Big points. Yeah, big points right there. So why don't more entrepreneurs go and do that, I wonder? Uh, I think a lot of them try to find people that right. have domain ex- uh, expertise on there. But I think at the end of the day, they want to pursue their own passion as well. Mm. And if they could find somebody, then all the better. But if they can't, but they still have that passion, then they, they'll just go, go at it regardless. Yeah. I sort of feel like that's part of the tell is who you surround yourself with. Yep. You know, talking about poker and poker tells and just uh, yeah. tells in general. So that's a po- that was the positive tell for you. These guys came from Mosey. Came from Mosey. Right. Um, what another, was the next one? Uh, their stats. Ah, yeah. statistics. Statistics. I think uh, in the demo, that. I think in the demo they, they showed how actually how fast it was yeah. to, to use Space Monkey. To repopulate that file. Yeah. And granted, we may not be able to replicate the same speeds, but I think one of the stats that were mentioned was like 60 times the speed of any other service that's out there. Right. And well, that's, that's ridiculous. And even you know, if they were, there. let's not say lying or exaggerating, yeah. but entrepreneurs can be, what's the word? They're not liars or exaggerators, but they might be... Hustlers. Well, clearly hustlers, but they might be delusional at times, <laughs> or they might be um, uh, Op- best case scenario Op- driven. Optimistic. optimistic. Thank Very you, Tom. Optimistic. So th- let's say that was an optimistic number. Even and then, you, even if you discount it fifty percent, yeah, or you discount it seventy five percent, or you discount it ninety yeah. percent, being six times faster than Dropbox is an extraordinary, extraordinary accomplishment. Yeah. Absolutely. Did and that I'll, go through your head at any point? Like maybe they're being optimistic? It did, not to the 90% level, but I'm thinking, well, maybe discounted by 50, 75%, oh. even then, just because I, I went through the same pain points myself. Another check box is like, do I personally have this pain point? Well, ah, and then, you had this pain point? I did, because I've been trying to upload HD video. Ah. And I just can't do it. See, that's why Space Monkey resonated with me. Yeah. I have HD video. I tried to use an online backup service. It did not work. Yep. It would never work. And I bought. I can't believe this exists. 128 gig SD card. Wow. I just thought about that. That's bigger than my professional yeah. Dropbox at 100 gig. Yeah. And I haven't taken the chip out, or and I don't empty the chip. It's my backup. <laughs> I leave it in the camera. Yeah. I think we're going to get to a point in time where your camera has enough storage, your, your digital SLR. Mm-hmm. I'm sh- assuming you're shooting on an SLR. Yes. Yeah. And you're doing the HD video 1080p HD video. on your whatever it is, Canon mm-hmm. 5D or your 60D, 70D, whatever it is, 7D. Mm-hmm. And that's the you, it, you that resonated with you because the upload speeds are so horrific. Yeah, exactly. And I figure everything's going towards HD video now, anyways. And that to be, just to be able to back it up. Yeah. Yeah. How do you back it up now? You just put it on an extra drive and bring the drive to work? I sit there and, yeah, I sit there and wait. Come. Or wait to an no, online I'll, backup or you have to do an, a drive to drive backup? Drive to drive. Right, which yeah. means you have to remember. And, and even then, it takes forever to do. Yeah. So. I have drive to drive backup now and I'm using a carbon copy mm-hmm. to make two copies of my hard drive and all the differences every night. So I bought three, two, three terabyte drives and I do that. And I got a, dro- um, a Drobo. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a junkie on this backup, but and, yes. And I still can't access it. Yeah, you know, it's still If my hard. drives go down at home, I'm always fearful that if something crashes at home, then oh, God, I've lost all my memories. Yeah. Um, so you went and bought it. Okay, so check, you had the personal problem. Yep. And so you get to like three checks and then ding, 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 ding. Is that it? Yeah, the more checks, the better on that. Another, Any other checks on that? Character. Character? Yeah, character. Huh. Yeah, I had a chance to speak with them the night before mm. the conference. And I could just tell by talking that they had uh, they were very stand-up great guys. You know what is a um, – it's interesting you mentioned character because I care a lot about that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, both on, am I being a an angel, and a, and a, an yeah. executive of character? I'm always very you yeah. know pushing myself like, is this the best thing I could do uh, for the company? Um, but I got the same sense from them. And when they had massive interest, you know, they honored all the investments from the launch conference yeah. when they had other offers that could have ran up the valuation. Yeah. 
and they just basically said, you know what, we're going to honor all the commitments from the launch conference. Which that's I great. Was a pretty big deal. That's huge. That's and huge. all tuition did the same thing. That's yeah. a pretty good sign of loyalty, I think. Yeah. Um, well, that's amazing. And so then you just said, I got to invest in this. Yeah. Um, what was the hardest part about investing in it? I know there's an interesting answer to this. Oh, really? Yeah. What was the hardest part about investing in Space Monkey? In yeah. Space Monkey? Yeah. The name? I don't know what. No, well, I'm curious. What, what for you was, what hesitations did you have, if any? I'm, I'm trying to recall. I don't really know if I had many hesitations. I think we did. Did I? Really? Yeah, but it has nothing to do with Space Monkey. Was it that they came to uh, 5A5 after the event and got totally hammered? No. no. Was it that they went to 5A5 after the event and didn't order Wagyu beef? No. What was it? Enlighten me. I, 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 maybe I heard it wrong because we had had a few drinks, but... <laughs> oh. Then you probably yeah, you heard No, it. no, no. <laughs> but Steve and... Tread lightly, Tyler. No, I'm, I'll be treading fine. Steve had become buddies with Drew from Dropbox oh. over, uh, over the year. Oh, yes. Oh, I hear the hiss. Yes. <laughs> I had that same thing because right? Drew from Dropbox was at the yeah. original TechCrunch. Totally. Uh, 40, the first year of the uh, launch event. and I did feel a little guilty. Yes. I felt guilty, too. That's yeah. weird yeah. that you feel guilty, but I wasn't an investor in Dropbox. Right. So exactly. you, if you're not an investor, you can't really feel guilty. In the, right. But you do get that I, sense that this could disintermediate Dropbox. Every, every yeah. time I go to 5A5, Drew's there. <laughs> like Almost every time I go there. I don't think Drew really cares. He's not cares. watching the show, is he? Uh, <laughs> he? I think he probably does, actually. I don't think Drew really cares. I'll tell you why Drew probably doesn't care. Because he's got such a huge, amazing service and so mm -hmm. many customers who are so in love with their product that I don't think when I get Space Monkey, I'm going to leave Dropbox. Yeah. I think I'll probably continue using it for my documents. And then I'll use this for like backing up my entire hard drive. And then at some point, yeah, maybe a push will come to shove and I'll pick one over the other. But I think he understands the, the concept of competition. and. Yeah. If this works as a model, there's nothing to stop Dropbox from selling a box and then taking the idea, you know, I mean, yeah. aside from a patent or something. Yeah. But I don't think that it's a particularly patentable idea. There might be specific things that are patentable in it. I'm not an IP <laughs> lawyer and I don't know, and I'm an investor in space money. Yeah. So I probably, that's probably about as far as I can take it, but. Yeah, um, Dropbox is doing fine on its own, so, yeah. Yeah, I don't think yeah. anybody's worried about that. Hey, and another service that's Picture doing mine. fine <laughs> <laughs> is Trada Trada. When you need SEM, that's, uh, search engine marketing, you need to call Trada. Uh, there's no need, no need to hire an in-house marketing team when you can get Trada to do your SEM. And they've got a huge team of pay-per-click experts and SEMs. Hey, pull up that dashboard there to show everybody. And here you can see on the dashboard, he, here is the optimizer, and here is their goal, their grade, A, B, C, very easy to understand. Here's their conversions, here's their conversion share, here's their cost per acquisition, the impressions, impression share, clicks, click-through rate how many active keywords are working, and you get a dozen of these people working on your uh, actual campaigns. How amazing is that? And you can see across all of them how you're doing. God, why didn't this service exist 10 years ago? Well, because Neil wasn't around, and he had the idea just two or three years ago, and it is crushing it. If you need SEM, you need to work with them. This is the best model for doing it. Even if you have an in-house person, why wouldn't you get 10 other people, 20 other people working on your project to find those crazy keywords that you can't think of? And it's all performance-based, and they do great. They work on all the major search engines, Google, Yahoo, Bing, and Facebook. And if you are part of the Twist community, you'll get free premium support. You ever do any SEM in your businesses? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. It's, it's a little bit hard, and it's, like, complicated. and it, it's, it's a little bit – it takes a little bit of time to set up, but once you get in it, it's, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Yeah. But then, do you know what keywords you're missing, right? Because you don't do it every day. Like, Correct. Not as well. Not do you know – I don't know – if there's like a competitor or some other keywords and what cat competitor keywords are using and oh, that maybe is great. other yeah, languages yeah. and other keywords and other languages, maybe people are typing in the, you know, French or Spanish word for steak when they're in the United States and looking yeah. for a steakhouse to go to in yeah. San Francisco. And you didn't even think of that, did you? Mm, not as much, no. Not as much, <laughs> not so much. That's why you need Trotta. Everybody thank at Trotta on their Twitter accounts. Everybody go use Trotta. And if you're doing SEM, this is the place to go. Um, what great guys. And as I told you before, we only accept services that we really can stand behind. And at Trotta is one of them. Thank you, at Trotta, for supporting This Week in Startups and independent media everywhere. So um, let's talk about all tuition. You invested in them as well. Yep. What did you love about all tuition? Uh, well, interestingly enough, they were the first company to present at the launch conference. Right. Which is challenging in a lot of regards because yes. you're kicking kick off. off a great conference. Well, and we picked them because I had a feeling they could win, and I told them they might win in yeah. the rehearsals. Yeah. And so, again, it was that right off the bat, it was a need that I didn't necessarily have right now, mm. but I saw the, the, you know, the big problem with just 
basically how do you pay for college mm. you know, out there and and it's been dominating the news at that time it was dominating the news sure and bill and all yep. the unpaid debts uh, what is it like one trillion right now is yeah i saw right peter thiel mouthing off about that recently and he was it's he's absolutely right like god there's so much debt and yeah. people need to really i mean higher education very considerate purchase mm-hmm. i mean it's right up there with a house and having a baby and cars i mean it's i guess it's the only thing more expensive is having your own kid or buying a house yeah i mean if you have multiple kids it's how do you how do you afford to pay for them it's insane yeah. and so that it that the scale of the problem appealed to you yes so that was a ding 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 as yep. an angel investor the bell rings you start salivating okay big problem yeah. what else uh you know the the, the passion when sue Clearly. was going on stage she's very very passionate about the product right. on there and the uh the the overall the ui was mm. was great it was Interesting. very smooth it was uh you could tell everything was very polished and just the flow was like very intuitive as a user i can just go in from day one and know how to use it from there um so you talked about the UX being amazing. How much do you think the startup world is UX driven today versus five, 10 years ago? You've been in the game for two decades. So, yep. I mean, it, you, you didn't hear people talking about design and UX in Web 1.0 at all. Not as much at all, no. I mean, in fact, let's be honest, the services that won Craigslist, eBay, PayPal, Google. I mean, these were pretty butt ugly, yeah. Google. I mean, these were horrific yeah. services. They were beyond... Um, Utilitarian. Yep. I mean, they were minimalist to the point of ugliness. Yeah. I think nowadays you have to have a good design. Why? 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 What's there? changed? Uh, you know, just one is just. Uh, I mean, well, if you look at Craigslist in particular, yeah. they survived way back when. But even now, they hired a team to redo their UX. Oh, they're redoing well. it. Yeah, on there, and I think it's just a part of people just used to seeing better designed things. You know, mm. and, and just the more visually appealing it is, also the more you want to actually use it too. So the customers are now looking for things that's, that look better. Yeah. It's, a custom, it's customer de- demand, so. right? They want things that are good looking. Do you think a service like Craigslist um, or you know Google or uh, eBay, with their huge network effects and huge brands, do you think design is a Achilles heel of those companies? Do you think Craigslist could be out Craigslist by a better design company? Or do you think it would be death by a thousand cuts where like Airbnb has a better design for you know, one thing, yeah. and then somebody else has a better design for jobs, Indeed.com, or whoever, Resumator, and then somebody else has a better design for this, you know? Yeah, I think once you, once you reach a certain scale, it's granted it's more difficult for people to get off of it. Like, people moving from eBay to sell their goods, that, that'd be challenging. You know, Craigslist had, was dominant in the market for local goods and services, but, you know, you've seen other people come up, you know, and, and basically take at least a portion of what Craigslist used to have from there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it could be death by a thousand different cuts, for that matter, if they don't change. It does seem like you, the, the level of design in UX has just gone a thousandfold. And yeah. it seems like it's super cheap to make very, very good designs. I was on the site Behance. Have, have you seen Behance? I Pull this up on my screen here okay. for a second. Behance. And I was just like, somebody was telling me like they couldn't, fi- they couldn't find like good design stuff. And I was just like, okay, if you can't find good design stuff, like... Let's say we were looking for um, a, um, a restaurant, right? And I search Behance for restaurant. And look at this on my screen, huh? And here are all these amazing designs. I say, you know what? I want to rank this by the most appreciated, not this week, but maybe all time, right? So these are the most appreciated designs in restaurants. And I, what's this one over here? Five and dime. Look at this gorgeousness. I don't know what this is, but five and dime with the, I guess you make a burger or something and this gorgeous eatery with the nice pencils and a nice I mean the logo is just gorgeous right it's beautiful I mean look at this thing I mean this reminds me of this is 5A5 steakhouse <laughs> level design and to, to do this in the past would have been extremely expensive now I can find this Bravo company in Singapore it's in Singapore and this Bravo company in Singapore and here's their other designs and see if their other designs are any good and lo and behold their other designs look really good too. What is this? The slowest way to make breakfast. That's <laughs> bizarre. But you get the idea. You just drill yeah. down, and all of a sudden, you're finding like interesting projects from these people. And then it, there's like almost no excuse. Design has been, 
I don't know. It feels almost like perfected, right? Yeah, I think you're right. It was neglected in the beginning, and now it's it's been a lot more. Well, you look at Apple as well. You know, they're built they, on yeah. user experience on there. And you know what? It's like it's. I do think Apple has become an arbiter mm -hmm. in that they won't feature an app without great design. Yeah. And you know, Steve Jobs, rest in peace, would bring only people on stage, you know, partners, mm -hmm. who had exceptionally designed products. Mm -hmm. And not only that, he would feature their products in their commercials. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he has to show you doing something on your, you know, iPhone, and yeah. it's going to be Instagram, or it's going to be Foursquare, yeah. or it's going to be something gorgeous, Path, whatever, Twitter, some gorgeous logo or app. I mean, in a way, I feel like he drove the entire industry to this yeah, point. Yeah, I definitely think he helped push to where it is right now, if not, if not let it, actually. So do you think it's a design-driven world, or do you think it's a, you know, feature and function-driven world? I mean, people always talk about form before, uh, function before form, or form before function. Where, where do you stand on this? You know, where I, does the, where, and where do startups stand on this? If you're looking at a company, great design, but few features, versus amazing feature comprehensiveness, but not a great design, where do you put your money? Where do you bet? You know, I, I think it's basically just, if you find those one or two great features that you can kind of push upon, and then design from there. You know, you don't need to have like a full feature set of like 10 or 20 different things. Just one or two things like Google, search, that's all they did, right? Very right. easy to use. And now they're over-designing it. Yeah. Now and it's getting a little it. messy, and then Bing yeah. is the antidote, right? Like Bing is saying we're gonna be yeah. just cleaner. Yeah, and they are. And they are. All right, so recapping, Steve Chen's um, ding, ding, dings, the bell rings, the angel salivates. He says he loves to see passion in an entrepreneur, and he saw that ensue from Walt Tuition. He loved the UX and design. He loved that there was a big problem to be solved. He loved the stats and the performance yep. revealed in those stats for mm -hmm. Space Monkey. He also really thought the character of the individuals was exceptional. Yep. And he loved the product founder match. Uh, what do they call that? Product market fit? He liked the product founder fit. You love the fit of the product and the founder, yeah. their past experience. There are your six yeah. bells that went off for you. And, and intelligence also kind of fits within. So everything. just a generalized intelligence. H how do you benchmark for generalized intelligence? Is that qu how they answer questions? How they answer questions and also just um, you, you look at their background, what they've also done previously uh, as well. So I, I think. Dovetails with the history. Yeah. What, like where they, uh, whether it's not like what they studied or where they studied and mm. things like that. It helps. But. Let's talk about the restaurant business for a second. Mm -hmm. Somehow you decided to become a restaurateur. <laughs> How did that happen? It's kind of almost by accident. Okay, let's actually. hear the accidental restaurateur story. Yeah. So we had, um, we actually started investing in different brick and mortar companies and startups years ago mm. from there. And we raised the money for 5A5, um, at least in concept at the time. And we identified the place. It was a restaurant called Frisson previously, owned by Peter Thiel. Ah. And, and then... Um, Two Peter Thiel drops in one show. Here yeah. we go. And then uh, they, you know, Rest for Sound did incredibly well for the first year, and then afterwards it started slowing down a bit, and they were losing interest just in the business, um, just in running it. And so one of our friends was an investor there and said, hey, are you guys interested in, you know, buying it from us? And I remember my, the very first time I walked into what was known as for Sound at the time, it was with my wife, and we're like, wow, this would be like our dream place to own. You know, it's beautiful, but uh, I think he spent maybe somewhere around four or five or six million dollars to, to build wow. the place. So we're, it's a stunning room. Yeah. I mean, and there's only 100 seats in the restaurant upstairs? Uh, yeah, a little over 100. A little over 100 upstairs. So they probably spent $50,000 a seat. Close. Yeah, close, I would say. Do restaurants measure that, like cost per seat? Yeah. Is that really a Absolutely. metric? I just guessed that that might be a metric. Absolutely. That's just how my brain works. I just yeah. immediately factors start to, your, I just divide number by number just to understand. Yeah, factors into your revenue projections, your cost projections, everything, staffing. So $50,000 per user mm -hmm. to, uh, of setup cost, mm -hmm. sunken cost, means that seat has to perform yeah. over its lifetime. If you, if you have a 10 year life on that, that's 5,000 a year. Mm -hmm. If you're open 300 days a year, you divide 300 days a year into uh, $5,000, and you would start to get to some pretty big numbers. Yeah. Yeah, most restaurants, our restaurants open, initially we started off maybe 300, a little over 300 a year, and now we're up to about 360 days a year. Wow. Now we're open. All right, so wait, I'm going to do the math for this. Five, if it was $5,000 <laughs> a year for the build-out cost divided by 300, how many days a year you're open? 
360. Wow. Mm-hmm. That means you got $13, $14 a day just to build the seat. That doesn't count maintenance or anything. Yeah. Would it last 10 years or does that design would last 10? You know, I, I think certain restaurants will last longer than others. I think right. a steakhouse, you think steak and potatoes. Yeah, it's going to last 20 years. It's going to be around. And uh, granted, we have a different take on the steak and potatoes, but sure. it's still at the end of the day, it's steak and potatoes. Right. And know. in a town like San Francisco, steak is okay? Steak is, I mean, it's great. You know, there are a lot of very good steakhouses in San Francisco. Mm. You know, I think uh, our version of it adds a little bit, something a little bit different, not right. just from the food, but the decor. Right. That's, that was one of the things we were really worried about. It's a gorgeous about. room. Yeah, we were worried about it because it wasn't, it didn't fall in line with the traditional steakhouse. Right. You know, you walk it's in. It's too elegant. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's too modern? a little more modern. Yeah. A little more modern. It's modern and elegant. Yeah. I mean, it's gorgeous, the banquettes thank and you. everything. Yeah, thank you. And, and so that's how we kind of started is right. with, we came up with like, this would be our dream place to own. We said, okay. We'll buy it. We weren't quite sure what, how we're going to do or what we're going to do at the time. But then one of our friends owned um, a restaurant, which is one of the st- highest rated steakhouses in the Bay Area at the time. Mm. And so we partnered with them to open it. Right. When we would just raise the money for it. Mm-hmm. And they would um, help actually run the front and back of the house. Mainly Great. kitchen and staffing. And we would, like, do all the marketing and all the fundraising for it. Wow. And uh, so in theory, that worked. Right. And uh, we, we started working on it. We were supposed to open in, like, one to two months. And signed the agreement, signed the lease, and then our restaurant partner backed out. Oh! Yeah, this is 2008. Oh, my God. During the financial crisis. During the financial crisis. You that, got that's punched why in the out. stomach. Twice, yeah. Twice? Yeah. Marron. And so at the time, we're like, okay, what What do you mean you're backing out? We had an agreement. We're ready to open in a <gasps> month and a half or two months. They're all, sorry, the economy's getting worse, and we don't know if we can open a high steakhouse right now. Wow. And so... Uh, at that time, for us, it was like kind of like, wow. Do we just shut down, or do we just Fold. try to make a go of it? Muck your hand, yeah. throw it in the muck. And wow. Being that we signed the lease, we're on the hook for you know a few years at least. <gasps> wow. You know, so, yeah. a lot of sleepless nights. It, it, you know, it was challenging, but I think at the end of the day, we just figured out. Well, this has kind of been our dream to start something like this. Yeah. And let's just do it. So, you know, the partners, the other partners that were involved. We have been working with for almost 20 years right. on that. We just said, let's just do it. And then my wife and I were there pretty much every day for the first year. 20-hour uh, days? <laughs> 15-hour yeah, days. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And then we were like, uh, and then we found out we were pregnant later oh. on. So we had two babies going Good at the times. same time. Yeah. And, uh, you launched two more restaurants, basically. Oh, uh, yeah. And <laughs> then we, hey, we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. We definitely yeah. did. But I think we just, we learned from the mistakes. We iterated. And the place and is doing better. gangbusters now. And now we're doing, you know, we're doing well. We're doing very well. A lot of nights is sold out. Pretty much. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know the owner. And I come rolling up, and they're like, yeah, you know the owner, but you didn't make a reservation. <laughs> the place is jamming. Yeah, I doing, have to make a reservation. Yeah, I'm your doing, friend. You, you I got to call well. in advance. You can get a reservation anytime, anytime. I know, but I still have to, like, be reasonable. I can't. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm used to just walking up and like, hey, I know the owner. I got eight people in my, and I roll deep, as you know. <laughs> and I'm like, Tyler's, like, calling ahead, making sure we get tables. But, yeah. I mean, Kevin Pollock came up. He had a great Kevin time. Kevin good. Yeah, he's uh, great. And you set him up at the kitchen table. Yeah, the chef's table. The chef's table. Yeah. Wow, that was very nice of you. Right. And asked our chef to come in and say hi to him, too. So. Yeah, that was very nice of you. I, I, Kevin was like, I'm trying to get into the steakhouse. I can't get in. I, somebody told me you know the person. I was like, yeah, I know the yeah. person. Yeah, Kevin's Made great. the quick phone call, but God, sold out, huh? Uh, you know, we're doing well. We're doing very well on that. And I think Not I, every night. I, I, uh, most nights. Really? Yeah, not every night, though. You're right. Not every night. But I think a, I owe a large part of that, actually, to you. What? Yeah, really. You're kidding. No. We, uh, 2009, I remember this. We did the TechCrunch 50 after party. Yep. When Red Beacon won. Yep. And actually, I'm still, I'm good friends with Ethan now. Right. You know, part, sure, in part because good. of that, actually. Yeah. And so you brought a lot of just uh, people in the tech community a out. A thousand people, yeah, yeah. Probably, I probably brought a thousand people to join. Yeah. And a lot of them still come out and support us. So. Really? They still come yeah. out, yeah. yeah. And you're very popular in the tech space, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what the thing is? You can lead a horse to war. You can't make them drink. I mean, if the product was terrible. Number one, I wouldn't yeah. be there. Yeah. And number two, they wouldn't come back. So, you know, like I can take credit for bringing them there, but you got to you got to take the credit for keeping them there. Right. It's been, we've had a lot of good help from a lot of friends. So. Yeah. Well, it's I think in the restaurant business, it's critical, you know, who is, I don't know, a fan of the place? I mean, t- tell yeah. me how Yelp and sort of super fans and, mm-hmm. you know, let's say influencers – how, what is the dynamic of early adopter influencers on the restaurant in your experience? You know, I think um, th- that's that's part of the biggest thing. It, it's how you start uh, not only creating your business, but how and where your business gets out to, those initial early adopters on that. And uh, Yelp, 
you know, a, a lot of businesses don't like it. I, I think we're, we're, we're fans of Yelp on there. Yeah. Um, twofold. One is, of course, if we get a great review, we feel great. You know, I get goosebumps every time I read about a great experience there. Sure. On that. And if we get a negative review, then it helps us learn from it, actually. Right. And you read every review. I read every review. And I try to respond to everyone uh, as much as, as time permits. Wait, does responding to a Yelp review look desperate by an owner? or Because de- I always thought, like, my God, if the if – because the, I just wrote a negative review of a place. And mm-hmm. I it was a place called Foundation here in L.A. over in Westwood. Because I just – I, I wrote a prickly review because I felt like the food was very good. Uh-huh. But – Anyway, and then I felt so bad about writing an interview because then the next time I went in, it was so good. Yeah. And then I was like, I wonder if this person's going to respond to my sort of the couple of bullet points I made that were sort of negative. Mm. And they didn't respond. And I just thought, I'm kind of pissed off they didn't respond. <laughs> How, what's the response? When, 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 so is it, there are two questions. One is, is it, is it, does it, do you worry that it looks desperate for somebody to respond or... And, and how do you mitigate against that? You know? Yeah, you know, I don't worry that it looks desperate as much. Um, I don't respond publicly in terms of, like, other people can't read the comments. It's a private message. Oh, is it only private? Because they can well, you publicly. Have the you have, you the, have the option. option. Yeah. So you respond to everyone privately. Yeah, everyone, as many people as I can privately. Um, publicly, I, I feel it. it's almost not petty, per se, from an owner's perspective, because uh-huh. a lot of people do it very well on there. It's mm. just I prefer to keep the communication offline um, in that right. sense from, like, public view right. on there. And I think, as I mentioned, I think Yelp is great. I think Tyler's new company is great. Squeal, yeah. It actually allows us to address the review before they put it up on Yelp. Oh, do you use his, you use Squeal? We're going to, yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. so he pitched you on you're going to. Yeah. Very good. I actually... We, we talked about it, so we were... Before... Yeah. In process. I in process. consulted with Steve before even building it. Yeah. I think Squeal's a pretty brilliant idea. I mean, just for people who don't know, Tyler has his own startup now, and it's called Squeal, and tell everybody what it does. You don't. You never want to talk about it on the I show. Don't, I don't like talking about it. You want me to explain? No. <laughs> All right, I'll explain. No, no, no. <laughs> what, what is appealing about Squeal to you versus, say, I mean, you respond probably in Yelp, but what is it in your understanding of Squeal that makes you want to use it? The ability to actually get in touch with the consumer before they leave the restaurant. Ah, uh, that's yeah. critical. Uh, that, that's, that's key. Cause Cause if it, I, because what you can, after they've left, your hands are pretty much tied in terms of resolving issues. Yeah, you can't resolve. Right. Resolution so, is over. And Yelp, by design, doesn't let you do the review while you're there mm. because... They don't want heat of the moment reviews. Mm, that too. It's a cool off period. That's what Jeremy told me. Well, there's one other reason why they don't do it. Because then if you could review it while you were there, then the venue could bribe you into leaving positive reviews. Ah. So maybe that's what he meant by mm. cooling off period, yeah. I don't know if that's his exact words, but he said that they want fuller reviews, more well thought out. Hmm. So yeah, so if people don't understand what we just said, what Squeal lets you do is put a text number at the bottom of your menu or tabletop you know, counter, you know, number or sign on the wall that says, if you have a problem while you're here, text the manager at this number. When you text it, it goes automatically to the manager of the restaurant on site, and then they can come see you. So you basically don't have to be embarrassed about asking to see the manager. You can just text your complaint and say, in detail, you know, my steak came out cold and the person can come. Because it it is a little bit frustrating that... Mark Suster had a cold steak, not at 585, but at <laughs> a Michael Mina restaurant in a St. Regis hotel. Michael Mina? Yeah. That's a big deal, yeah. The one in St. Regis in Orange County. And they came to his table and said, oh, we heard your steak is overcooked. And um, they comped his entire dinner. And they said, what would you like? Not for, just the steak. The not just dinner. the steak. They said, what do you want for dessert? That's unnecessary. I hate when they do that. But then asking. I wouldn't, I wouldn't by the way, accept that. Because I, I would feel too bad for the He's, restaurant. That's what he said, too. He unnecessary. Goes, that's what he Especially said. Especially for a rich VC who's making a million dollars a year. He, in fairness... Or whatever. I don't know Mark Schuster's salary. He, he, in fairness, said, I, I don't want you to comp my whole meal and offer me dessert. Mark Schuster makes $10 million a year. I don't want to insult him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm just making it up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was actually one of the very first... Yeah, uh, you can do the preemptive thing. So, in order to respond on Yelp, mm-hmm. do you have to pay Yelp anything? Like no. you, So... What do you, why do you think restaurant owners believe that Yelp is trying to hold them hostage? What do you think all that's about? What, you know, I, that miscommunication, or is it just aggressive salespeople there maybe yeah. being rogue salespeople? Why do they get this bad rap? And it seems like it's, it's starting to subside. You know, but what I, do you think it was caused by I've, as a restaurateur? Uh, yeah, I, I've heard that a lot and, and read about it a lot, obviously, as well. Um, and I, I, I don't believe that any of that takes place on there. I know that Yelp does their algorithms where – sorry, when I mean the – the bribing. Yeah. The there is no way a yeah. professional public company like Yelp 
yeah. would be involved in bribing people. No. Yeah, I don't think it happens at all. No. Yeah, and, so and it's the algorithm of what gets shown up top. Yeah. And that the restaurant does get to pick their favorite review? Is that the... Not anymore. Oh, they used to have that. Yeah, they used to have that. And they to, to kind of make it more transparent, they removed that as well. Ah. And so really... It's, um, that was probably what caused it. See, the, for background people, if you were, if you paid Yelp money, if you were a sponsor, one of the features they offered was pick your favorite review. Yep. And that essentially gave you the ability to push down other reviews and make the top one your favorite, yep. which is, I guess, gave some people the perception that you could pay to play, but that's not exactly true, but they got rid of that one feature anyway for yep. perception reasons. Yep. So how do, how do they make money now, Yelp? What, how, do you pay Yelp anything? Advertising. Ah, so do you pay for advertising on Yelp? We do pay for advertising. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah, I think it works. Uh, they actually show us certain metrics as to how many people clicked through. Mm -hmm. I think the part that's not as obvious is how many people made reservations through those clicks. Ah. So it's it's tough to actually quantify how many how well it works. And you have OpenTable as well? Yep. Now, OpenTable, I hear restaurateurs hate it <laughs> because it's a dollar per seat or more or more is or it more is it more they have Two different promotions at times ah because yeah. so i've hold, heard it's a couple of dollars and i, and I can tell that like, it's this conversation making you uncomfortable because they're no. such a no. they because some people in the restaurant business I've, I've read some blog posts where they are absolutely furious at open table yeah. and they feel like they're charging a tax for this you know three four dollars per person and you got to lose ten dollars per table do you feel that way uh, you know, we view it as more of a marketing tool mm -hmm. on there. I think when we first launched, you know, in 2009, when we first opened, well, okay, how do we get the word out there? Right. And especially in the Bay Area, if you don't exist on OpenTable, it's almost like you, you lose a huge chunk of your reservations to start off with. Wow. So as a, at least for the Bay Area, just deciding which type of a reservation system to use, mm -hmm. it was just like, Understood that we're going to go with Open Table. Right, they have yeah. just a monopolistic for longest, position. For the yeah. longest time, they were the really only the only game in town yeah. until they like, were, and yeah. they survived through the two crises: the yeah. financial crisis and before that. Yeah. Now you pay to have that machine that does your seating as well. So there's a double mm -hmm. lock-in, right? Yep. So when I load the Open Table app and book a table, if you're not in their system. You, you might as well not exist, especially to travelers. To a lot of people, exactly. Especially travelers yeah. and sa computer savvy people. Which are some of the best customers. Yeah. yeah. And because you use their table reservation system, you, do you have to pay for that system still, like a 1000 bucks a month or something? Are they charged yeah. for it? There, there's a certain fee that we have to yeah. pay a month. It's not that fee. much, though, from what I understand. Yeah. But for small restaurants, I heard that they're very furious about It's a little more prohibitive. This. I mean, the, the typical margins you run in a restaurant is like fine dining is between 4 to 6%, I believe. <gasps> and fast food wow. is better. But if you're a small mom-and-pop shop, you can't really afford the hundreds or maybe even 1000 or more per month. Right. You're spending an open table. Right. And so, so why hasn't an open source like open, you know, flat rate competitor emerged or are they? Are you getting they, pitched on it? We get pitched on it all the time. Really? Uh, yeah, all the time. And yeah. so are you available on other systems? You don't have to be exclusive to open table, right? Uh, you don't have to be exclusive. Right. No. So there's uh, no reason not to be in other reservation systems. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing is we use OpenTable as the central reservation system. Got it. On there. And so if you're we don't want to overbook. Right. You know, on there. Unlike like you know, let's say flights, they overbook. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, for as a restaurant. Overbooking is costly for you. Yeah. So you get really upset customers. Yeah. So we, we can't overbook. And in that way, it's just to have a centralized reservation system, it helps decrease the likelihood of that happening. Really, it So can you get the data out of OpenTable? Could another vendor query your OpenTable and say what reservations are open, or is it a closed system? Uh, my understanding is that it's a closed system. Right. Uh, probably by design, but right. I'm not 100% sure on that. And it's, but it's your data, so you should be able to open it if you wanted to. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not completely sure on that. Mm -hmm. They might have changed it recently. Yeah. It seems yeah. to me like that. If I'm an entrepreneur, I'm building a service that hacks into your open table. Yeah. Right? This is what I would do. And charges a flat rate, $50 a month, mm -hmm. unlimited reservations, not per seat, whatever. Or even, you know, 25 cents or 50 cents per person. And if Open Table doesn't allow somebody else to use that data, which is owned by the restaurants, mm. they would have a massive class action suit. Oh, yeah. And they would, so I think that's a big Achilles. Why doesn't Yelp mm -hmm. have their own reservation system? Uh, they partner with Open Table. Right. So right Open now. Table paid them off big time. I don't know exactly how that worked, but. Well, I mean, they must be giving half the money to Yelp because, I mean, if, if Yelp had two or three systems in there and you could book a table, it's almost like Fandango and those kind of things. It's like they get this well, deep it, exclusive. There was also, Yelp had the fear that OpenTable is going to start getting into reviews, and OpenTable had the fear that Yelp's going to get into 
reservation, so they like, let's not kill each other. And Yelp has to do reservations. I think that's part of their agreement. Is the other side's not going to eat the other side's Guaranteed life. when that yeah. thing expires, whenever it expires, and it must be public, like in, because OpenTable and Yelp are both public. So yeah. there, that's a place to insert yourself into the process. Yeah. I think the biggest reason why we, we won't leave OpenTable anytime right. soon right yeah. now is, again, it's the marketing. Right. on there they drive a huge percentage of the business coming because th they'll break it down for us this percentage coming from open table this percentage coming from your website through phone calls oh so they else. give you some transparent yeah yeah and what about buying traffic to open table have they built that glue yet like where you could say i want to you know get more traffic to my reservations and i want to do an ad spend or i want to plug sure. you know google adsense or facebook into open table how does that work? Sure. They, they have certain links with Facebook and other forms of social media, yeah. but uh, other ways that they offer, like mm. these perks, yeah. is uh, like I was saying, they charge an extra amount for um, certain types of reservations. Oh, featured. Yeah, featured to be featured on top levels and yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, I want to say we, were, we we tried that out for a little bit Yeah. on there, and we were probably, I would say, venture to guess that we were probably paid Open Table the highest out of any restaurant in the Bay Area. Well, you for have a a, time. Oh, because it's an auction. Uh, a style it's, or no, it's not an auction. Oh, you're just saying just because based of the nature the of how many bookings you have, right? Yeah, based on the bookings. I mean, people want to go to celebrate, to have a nice steak somewhere, and yeah. you have exceptional reviews. Right. So, what about other technology? Have you guys thought about like having waiters have you know a POS system it, in their it's hand? Funny you mentioned that. We were actually just talking about that, like. This towards the end of last year. Because that was the, as well. it used to be the tell when you had that system that you didn't have good servers. Yeah. Right? It used to be, it used to connote if you came to my table with a tablet or an mm -hmm. iPhone, that meant you didn't have a good waiter. Is that the same today? You think that's changing? Or did you agree with that assessment? Uh, I don't know if I agree with the assessment, but I think for certain types of restaurants, it's, um, they still, at least today in present day, yeah. you have to have the server you know, um, for that type of restaurant. I think yeah. for us, what we've seen as well, especially in the Bay Area, that uh, restaurants are becoming more digital mm. and that there are some, some wine lists are on iPads right now. Out You're there. kidding. So there are huge stories on there, and that's, wow. a, and that's pretty interesting. I think to get to the evolution where I think someday all the restaurants are going to be, most all the restaurants are going to be, you know, digital menus, digital everything, tracking. Really? Um, I think it so. makes total sense for the iPad. You know why? Because it's so dark in restaurants. Yeah. And to read the goddamn wine list is horrific. <laughs> and then you have no idea about the wine itself. Yeah. But to be able to really see the, you know, a, yeah, it absolutely. poured in a glass and what the color is. Absolutely. And that's pretty vibrant. So are there any startups doing that, just wine yeah. lists? Is, yeah. it a, is it a startup focused on that? Or is it like just like vendor integrators coming in saying, I'll put your wine list on this? You know, there are starters fo startups focused on... Um, not just wine lists, but just menus in general. Uh -huh. So including wines and others that we've seen come through. And do you think ordering from it is, is something that will eventually happen? I mean, when you go to China, for example, mm -hmm. there's things like Red Bell or other things. Every table at every restaurant in China, yep. people don't know this in the United States, has a bell. Yeah. And you press the bell, and in the back, it, the table number lights up, and the person comes running out. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's an incredible experience. Yeah. But that would be considered cheap here in the United States in a way. I think to certain regards. Yeah, that's why, it, like, more of a certain types of restaurants would work out mm. more so. I think for, like, a, more of the higher-end restaurants, it's a little more difficult to implement that right now. What if it was gorgeous? You know, like, what if it was, like, a device that was just absolutely stunningly gorgeous, like, mm -hmm. in terms of design, where you just sort of swiped your finger on it and it just glowed that the person was coming or something and the person just got a little vibration, yeah. you know, or something on their watch. Like, if it was done with incredible design on Kickstarter, you want to do that as a Kickstarter project with me? Maybe, yeah. Wouldn't that be let's a good one? Let's do it. I'm d I love that Kickstarter. Yeah. I, I love those physical products. Wouldn't that be a great one, like a little bell that was so well designed that it didn't take away from the design of the yeah. table. Like the ones in China are ganky, plastic, disgusting. Just regular ding bells? They're not ding bells. They're more like you press them and they just light up, but yeah. they're like from mica and okay. just plastic. Yeah. I'll show you on my screen. So what other technology in the restaurant, you know, in startups, have you embraced or thought about, you know, or, yep. or that have come pitching you that you've said, hmm, that's a really interesting idea. The digital menus, is it? So Did you're actually thinking of doing a digital menu? Yeah, yeah. I would that be optional? I can get the regular menu or the print one, or do I take out my iPad and load your app? How does it work? We would we would provide. We talked about actually providing the iPads, you know, to every restaurant. Oh, sorry, to every table at our wow. restaurant. Oh, no, that'd be kind of cool. And I think another thing for us is like, it uh, it it's the general eventual evolution 
of where everything's going to go. But right now, it just, it's just going to take time to do that. Just one is um, the ability to track and get information, demographic information, as well as uh, all sorts of other information about your customer that's coming in. I think it's one of the things that's lacking in the restaurant industry right now. Mm. And so just the ability to kind of see that and see how much, which types of items they order, how often they come in, mm. how much they're spending, you know, things like yeah. that. So you can target your promotions. We've been, uh, been approached by quite a few companies that try to attack a certain piece of that. Yeah, but nobody's got a full-on no. great solution. No. Hmm. Here it is, guys. Look at my screen here for a second. Pull it up. Um, you're going to get a kick out of this. Look at <laughs> this, huh? You could see yourself having that, right? Service, bill, cancel. Yeah. It's bizarre. Those have been in Japan for ages. Yeah. It's... I've seen those in Asia. But I've never seen a triple like that. Have you seen them like that with the triple? I've only seen one bell where you ring the person comes Japan over. And it's just one button, yeah. That's a kind of cool thing, though. You, just, you, could, you could get the bill, um, and they, they've got tons of these. And then this is what happens. On, some people are wondering what happens on the back end. Just this really ganky, like, wireless thing in the back where you, you know, get, like, a, a number lights up in the back like that. They're really, like, cheap and ugly. They cost nothing to build. But, uh, yeah. Let's talk. <laughs> I would like to. You know, look at all these different service call buttons. It's amazing. Um, and so you think loyalty? Are loyalty programs... Again, for a high-end restaurant, considered because a lot of this is perception, right? Yeah. And what we're talking about is the perception of technology versus the benefit. Mm -hmm. Is the perception if you have a loyalty program that you're a failing restaurant? I think there's a general perception out there if you offer a, any sort of discounted product mm. that you're a little more maybe desperate in, mm -hmm. a, in a certain ways. So no discounting. So that's why it's it's uh, that's why you know Apple never really discounts, right? Right. Well. No discounts. They're so we're no. going to provide you with the product and buy it that's you know, it from there yeah um, so once if apple were ever were to ever start discounting like 50 percent off sales i think it would decrease the uh, allure of their product as mm. well and, and the same kind of holds true with the restaurant industry you know there have been like the different daily deal sites that have been coming out mm -hmm. and i think they've been trying to evolve it definitely hits when they launched like when groupon launched i think it was what 2009 time yep. frame somewhere in there yeah yeah Economy fastest growing was, startup ever or eight yeah. maybe yeah the economy was horrible yep People and were restaurants desperate. restaurants needed this yeah. as well. And people wanted the discounts. It was desperate times for both parties. Yeah, exactly. And so... People needed a deal on both sides of the equation. Yeah. And with the restaurant, it was an infusion of you know, new customers coming in with, with guaranteed money up front already. So restaurants, a lot of times, they just look like month to month. They don't look like a year or two years down the road. They're mm. all, I need to make payroll next month or mm. like next week. You know, what can I do to generate more business? And so Groupon actually launched, at, well, at least that version of Groupon launched... At the right time. Right. Yeah. But you would never do a Groupon. You would never need to. You no, know, Groupons would be would be challenging. I, um, we have partnered with other types of sites that have actually presented our product in a better light. Mm. Uh, no, a better light, but in a different light. A more refined light. Yeah, in a different I light. Yeah. yeah. And how did it work? Uh, it worked It worked well. Really? Yeah, we, we, 2009 is the first year that we, we launched. Mm. And in the beginning, it was just it was more, a little more difficult getting the word out there. Mm. So we viewed it as kind of a marketing expense. Got it. So we tried some promotions then, but always ones that kind of present it in a certain light. See, so what I think is for, for a restaurant like yours, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, maybe selling an enhanced experience at, a, mm -hmm. at great value. Mm -hmm. So we're having our Monday night flights of wine with flights of whatever, mm -hmm. and it's our flight night. You know, come to flight night and enjoy these things. Like I see like AOC or, yeah. you know, the high-end restaurants here, Tavern. They, I'm on their email list. And they'll email me something. It's usually based on the, the value of the product. Exactly. Not the discount, yeah. but the value. What's the difference? You know what that reminds me of? What does it remind you of, Tyler? Used wedding rings. It's up from Tyler. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yeah. That's my what look. Okay, how so? <laughs> now I got I got so? I got an insight from Tyler Rest. That's why we put this here. Go ahead. How so, as Steve Chen says. Well, have you ever seen a place selling, you ever gone into a jewelry store and they're like, sir, here's our fine selection of, well, first of all, 50% of people get divorced. Where do all those wedding rings go? The, right? There's a heck of a lot of used wedding rings out there. Right. And a used engagement ring, how would you know if it's used or not? Scratches, I guess, but yeah. I mean, basically, you you're, no wife, want, nobody you're going to propose to, man or female. But they wouldn't know. Would want to get a used one. So there has to be a perception. 
you may want to go in for value and buy one, but you want to make sure you present it as new. You, you, you may want the value on a used is, wedding ring. My point is there's the emotional value and then the actual value. Mm-hmm. The actual value of the ring didn't go down. It's probably pretty much the same, right? Diamonds are indestructible, yeah. so you polish that the, bad boy the, off. The it's, ring didn't go down in value. And in fact, if it was your grandmother's, it, it went up in value. It, that's right. Right. <laughs> same product. <laughs> same product. Same value. Perception. Same context. Emotional value versus actual value. All right. Now comes the fun part of the program. You have something to add to that, Steve? Or you just you want to leave it alone? Just leave I, it alone. I'm not even going to touch that. Yeah, <laughs> don't even, when, Tyler, when Tyler's on his roll, just go for it. Because you know what? If you encourage him, we could wind up with something even worse. Or, or, or a new idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. This is the fun part of the program in which you tell us, because, you know, customer support is a critical part of the restaurant business and also entrepreneurship. Tell us the most ridiculous customer support without details, identifying details, of course, that you've had to endure. Who is, what was the most unreasonable customer? Because you're, you're a very laid back guy who can handle a lot. But there must have been somebody in the years of running this mm-hmm. you know, restaurant that pushed you to the edge. Oh, that story right there, the one you don't want to tell. <laughs> that's the one I want. So take a deep breath and understand that nobody's going to know who this person is and that it's okay for you to tell the story. Go ahead. It'll make you seem sympathetic. Yeah. People will identify with it. Okay. Uh, one does come to mind. Okay, here we go. No names, of course. No names. Brace yourself. So we had a guest come in and uh, basically someone else made the reservation. Okay. Another name. Another name. Mm-hmm. And they came in with a you know pretty large group. And I guess their host told them the time but made it half an hour earlier so that everyone would show up on time. Got it. And so the table, it was a busy night. Mm. And their table was maybe 15 minutes over. But they thought it was like 45 minutes over. Right. So he basically started yelling at my manager Ooh. initially. And our managers, you know, they're trying to be very polite. Right. I, and actually, the times I've come, they were female managers. So I don't know if it's a male or female he's yelling at. but Male. It was a male in this male case. Male manager. Okay. okay. And then also... Um, I mean, you have a delightful staff. Thank I you. mean, these are the kindest people. I've, yeah. I mean, I, I've gone to the best restaurants in the world, and this is among the finest. Yeah, we're very I proud mean, of, our, of, our, of our team. Uh, among yeah. the finest so. staff. And I know I'm a VIP when I'm in the restaurant, yeah. but still, <laughs> it, I know good service when I see it, Thank and you. this is exceptional service. Continue. Yeah. And so, um, and then afterwards, he started yelling at pretty much anyone he could see hmm. out there about how the reservation was 45 minutes past their time, and he was right. hungry, and this and that. Is he drunk? No. Wow. No, he was sober. See, if it's tr- almost like if it's drunk, you sort of can just chalk it up, right? Yeah. Drunk customer happens, right? Yeah. I mean, like, you're just like, okay, well, we're happy you're drinking the wine. Yeah. You know, like, we'll deal with a little bit of misbehavior. Yeah. And then, um, and then so then I, and then he saw me, and I was in a suit and a tie, and he started yelling at me. Oh, boy. And then, uh, and then I tried to calmly explain to him that, you know, the reservation was at this time. Right. And sorry that your table's late, but we're trying to do our best to, because we, yeah. don't, we don't kick people out of their tables that are dining there. Please tell me that he doesn't go up to the table of people finishing their dessert. That's happened on other, other occasions, but not this time. Okay. Whew. On there. So basically, he uh, after he finished yelling at, I think I was the fourth person he was yelling at. Wow. On there. Then we were able to clear up some other seats for, for him. him. But I've never had like anyone yell at that many people. You, really? Usually it's like one person will calm down and then we'll offer them something. Yeah, a little something. Bit here and there. Have a beverage and they're generally on us. reasonable. Yeah. Hey, Jeremy, buy a personal glass of wine. Yeah. You had somebody go to the table and say, "Get the f up." It's my table. Yeah. Uh, on another occasion, once before. <gasps> well, maybe maybe not in those terms. Right. Yeah, but somebody said, "Hey, we're waiting on the table. Would you yeah. mind?" And it wasn't even their table. <laughs> so, but they just wanted a table. I had the, my dad. You know, I grew up in the restaurant business. Yep. yep. And uh, so I always have a, you know, soft spot We had a very it. different solution to this problem when we were there last time. Oh, I have always got the solution to this problem. No, no. <laughs> when somebody's at the table? No, no. When we, last time Tread we were lightly, five, Tyler. Last time we were at 585. Tread lightly, Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> we, like, the t- it was hard to get a re- We didn't call in a reservation because no. we, th- we think we're players, right? Right. We think we're ballers. <laughs> and then we come we, in and they're like, whoa, whoa. We can whoa. just show up. And <laughs> to, well, that has happened on occasion. But yeah. the truth is, the place is... It was, Very popular it was now. We, and we should and we do make reservations now. Yes. We always call ahead. But so Day they, ahead. they were we had a party Two of eight ahead. and they were able to get us a table for four. And so I yeah. call you at home and so I'm like, yo, this is just, just what's going Jake on. Jake I just rolled in knocking tables. All right. Over. Anyway. So, I remember that. So we sit down at the party of four. Right. 
and, and we just add and four more sl- seconds. And, and then start slowly. <laughs> we all the points. Every, every five minutes. That wasn't my fault. Another t- In my defense. We end up squeezing eight people into this Which table I think your four. team actually it was a big supported. by the time we got there. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was just everybody was on the bank at having such a good time. And we you know, always have such a great time. Oh, I appreciate night. that. But my dad taught me the best trick. The best trick. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. I'm listening. I'm this up. is, and my dad was, you know, I talk about my dad like he's dead. He's not dead. My dad is so brilliant mm-hmm. when it came to things like this. He would come to the table and say, we've had such a wonderful time having you here. And, you know, we accidentally overbooked the restaurant tonight. I was wondering if I could buy you a drink at the bar and dessert mm-hmm. and just sit and have dessert with you guys, mm-hmm. myself as the owner, um, just because I got to free up the That's table. Good. But if you want to sit here, it's totally fine. Um, more than happy to accommodate you, yeah. but I screwed up. Yeah. He did this. Not only did 100% of the time the people say, absolutely, free dessert at the bar, mm-hmm. and dessert, by the way, or a cordial, cost you nothing. Not much at all. Not much. And my dad was such a baller, he would say, uh-huh. you know, like, have what I'm having, like this grappa, whatever. He's got this amazing drink he mm-hmm. would pour. He's pouring them grappa. By the way, grappa, as you know, is the most vile, like, made from the rinds of <laughs> grapes. <That's> grapes. <laughs> it's, it's putrid. It, yeah. it, it is the worst liqueur you could ever get. That's the liqueur that the poor people would drink after the wine was made mm-hmm. and, and port was made. They would just take the rinds, and they had nothing to do with it but throw it to the hogs. So instead they made grappa grabbing, out of it. We're having chink after this, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What? We already have a date set for after. Anyway, grappa is grappa. garbage. Anyway. <laughs> He would, he would, but he would give them something that was not expensive, whatever. Um, and then, because he would go have the drink with them at the bar and talk to them, they would become lifelong customers yeah. because they got to have a drink with the owner and talk to them. Yeah. So it was his way of, you know, like it was a double win. Just awesome, Dad. Yeah. Really good. That's move. great. I think he might have been one of the pioneers for that because we, I think a lot of the restaurants try to use that exact playbook right now. Oh, is it really? Yeah, we try to do it when we have space in the lounge or in other areas as well. Oh, possible. really? And you've done it? Yeah, we've done it. How many um, times does that work for you? Four out of five? It works most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say four out of five at least. Uh, mm. The difference is when there's like a business meeting, you know, taking place. Ah, uh, yeah, they don't want to stop. Yeah, so like originally, let's say a dinner we thought would take two and a half hours, is now at four hours. Oh. And that's tough to kind of move them all up, especially if they You really can't yeah. move them out, right? It's, it's like tough. It's just against the grain of restaurant. You know, if, yeah, you, you know, if you come in, you can take as long as you want. And some people do. But, oh. you know, it's just... What's the longest somebody sat there and then stopped drinking from their last order? Because that's the thing that really gets to you as an owner. It's like, it's not that you were at the table for five hours. It's that you stopped ordering at two hours and five hours oh, in. We've had four or five hour dinners. Easy. And not yeah. order for the last hour or two? Not order after two and a half hours. Oh. Yeah. So this is, if you want to be, this is what I always do. If I'm going to take the table for that long, I'm just going to order a bottle of wine yeah. or a bottle of Veuve Clicquot, something. You know how I do with the Veuve. Yeah. I just pop a bottle of Veuve for a hundy as rent for the last hour of yeah. the table or whatever, just to let the person know, like, at least I bought a bottle of Veuve here or something yeah. to keep the party rolling. And even if I don't drink it, you know, whatever. Yeah, but I, I think we try to plan as much as we can in advance. Hmm. And then, you know, if... And if they take a four, three, four, five hour dinner, then our view is that that's their right too. And we'll just figure something out on the other Having end. Having the restaurant really is an asset as an angel, isn't it? Yeah, definitely is. You close a lot there? You cl- a lot of closing I, going you on? Know, I, come by for a drink, come by for lunch, the restaurant's not open, I'll make you a little something, something. Yeah. That's yeah. why I need a restaurant. It's uh, you know, now as an owner of a restaurant, in the beginning, the first year, year and a half was not as um, fun. Mm. And now it's to the point where, I mean, it, things are running smoothly. Our mm. chef is now a co-owner who's amazing. Oh, right that's way. great. I yeah. met him, yeah. His, what's yeah, his name great. again? Alan. Alan, yeah, his aces. Yeah, he's great. And then... So and by the way, the so menu is fantastic, even if you're not into uh, steak. I mean, the fish, amazing, tremendous. Thank Everything's yeah. great. Thank you. Even about my wife's a vegetarian. She's, you always accommodate her really amazing Good. with the veggies. Yeah, and next everything. time you guys come up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. this has been an amazing episode and really great to have an angel entrepreneur and restaurateur on the program. Uh, Steve Chen's album, Thug for Life, coming out in 2013. Uh, it's a, you do a duet on that, right, Tyler? Thug for Life? We didn't even talk about his new thing coming up. What new thing? Screen date. Oh, tell us. Sorry, I didn't know. That's okay. This, this is the new thing. I, yeah, nobody tells me anything. What, what's this, a new thing? What is it? Tell me. It's a new project I'm working on. Okay, let's hear it. Screen what? Screen date. Oh, okay, I like that. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm so, typing it in. Yeah, so we basically create, like, 
offline events for people to meet at. But ah. the main difference is that you actually get to pick and choose who goes to these events or gets invited to these events before the event takes place. Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, wait. So who gets to pick? Our members. Which know- members get to pick? <laughs> this sounds like yeah, uh, Lord of the Flies here. So it's actually, it's uh, when we first started out, we did this uh, basically as a, as a small offshoot of our business back mm-hmm. seven years ago. We organized like speed dating events back Got then. It. But we used to organize a lot of just social events for people to meet at in general. And then our friends would always ask us, you know, Steve, how do I actually meet people at your events? And like, right. Well, Tyler, Christina, Christina, yeah. Tyler. Got it. But the problem was they could never, they didn't know anything about them, about each other. And the environment wasn't as conducive to a good, like a normal good conversation. So we started mm-hmm. thinking, well, what if we just started doing speed dating events? Because mm-hmm. in theory, they make sense. You right, sure. Of, speed you know, dating, people love that. A lot of people in a short amount of time. Right. And you, know, you generally know in the first few minutes, if not seconds, mm-hmm. whether or not you want to continue talking to that person. Right. But I think the biggest challenge is how do you get into the environment where you actually get to meet these people? So you have to be v- voted in. You have to be voted in, exactly. Um, wow. But the thing is that uh, you you basically, as a, as a member, you get to vote on who you want to see. And it's ScreenDate.com? ScreenDate.com. And you'll do them by ethnicity as well? They'll do it by whatever you want. So you can break it down by background, height, age. Oh, ethnicity. so you're the platform. You're not actually running. We, we organize the physical events for people to meet at. Ah. But you, as a person, get to choose whoever you want to meet. So that way it's kind of, it's peer driven. In that Got way. it. Um, any controversy about like, hey, I want to get into the, I know Tyler dates a lot of Asian women. If he tries to get into this, it's American born raised Asians. Is that, Tyler's out of luck? Uh, it's those interested in meeting American born Asians. Ah. Yeah. So it's, you don't have to be necessarily American born. Right. Because Tyler, by the way, when we're walking down the streets in Japan, this is a true story. Uh-huh. Woman comes up to Tyler, grabs his arm, and will not let go. How many blocks? Three, four, five blocks? Literally, it's a 15 wow. minutes of her. And she, was, she was an attractive, normal, seemingly normal woman. <laughs> and Other this than the happened. Fact that you're taking on the <laughs> Literally <laughs> hanging on and talking to him in Japanese. And when we, and she's blushing. And it's just unbelievable, wow. Tyler. That's good. Um, That's good so this go. is what? Like a social it's network a for? If you want the I guess secret so. fragrance, you can send 2595 to. Yeah. These are very attractive people, by the way. I'm taking a little look here, and these are very attractive individuals. Still in private beta. so. Still in private beta. Yeah, yeah for those that don't know, Steve knows pretty much all the good-looking girls in the Bay Area. So. Oh, now I know why you're always rolling with Steve. Um, well, that's a really good idea. What about mobile? I mean, this would be a great mobile thing, too, like to do it on a nightly basis, like have You're, it roaming. You hit the, yeah. When does the iPhone app, Android app come out? We're actually talking to some developers right now. We should. This is a really good idea. I mean, what was the... Matter of fact, to tie a loop together here, me and my last girlfriend, who I'm still good friends with, and Steve knows well as well, yeah. our first date was at 585 before it even opened. Wow. We were in the kitchen. Yeah, that's right. Now, that's a baller move, Tyler. You're like, hey, listen, let's go get dinner. And she's like, all right, where are we going to go? And you're like, yeah, let's just stop by my friend's place. It's not open yet, but I'm sure he'll cook for us. Yeah. That's, well, I, I can't that was a good, that was a good assist. No, they eat. had the, the killer wine selection downstairs. That was a killer assist. The wine list. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. That's a killer assist. I used to do that to him. My brother was managing a bar. I'd be like, I meet a girl. This is when I was in my early 20s. And I'm like, yeah, let's go to my brother's place. And uh, I'd be like, it's 5 a.m. And yeah. like, the club just closed at 4 or whatever. I'd be like, yeah, let's go to my brother's place. We were after hours. Yeah. Like after hours, what? Oh, the door's locked, but not three times. So know? probably going to do some of the events at 5A5. As sure. Well, some of the screen date events. Yeah. And I think another thing that we had with, uh, with screen date, back then it was just the speed dating events. Right. Because, you know, in theory is one thing, but in practice what we saw was that we averaged a marriage from those two years of events, we averaged a marriage every one and a half events. Wow. So this wow. is like eHarmony in real life. Yeah. It's like basically putting just compatible people with each other in a room. Hmm. And then if you don't, if you think you connect on paper, but then you actually see them and, you know, there's no chemistry whatsoever, then you move on to the next one. Which yeah. is fine. Now, is it like speed dating where you're lined up one against the other? Yeah, so we have uh, different different kind of um, versions of it. One yeah. is speed dating right? where you have to actually meet everyone else that's there. And we do, like, generally 15, and 15 men and 15 women, somewhere in wow. that range on there. Or we also do, like, mixers. Wow. So imagine just going to a mixer or a bar, like we talked about, or, yeah. or something, where you already know off the bat there's going to be, like, 15 to 20 women that you actually want to meet that want to meet you. So it has to be... Compatible, mutual. Ah, so everybody's got to vote. Yep. That, and if you apply to go, and enough of the people who are already registered. Exactly. So you have to, oh, so the way this algorithm works is like PageRank. You pick the top 10 sites that you trust, 
Yep. And then they decide the rest of the page's ranks by the links they send out. Sure. So you would, you would so choose... So you see the first three men and women? Is that how it works? And then you trust their judgment from there? No. So you would actually, out of... You, you would browse the profiles based on whatever parameters you put in. Uh -huh. And then you just say, oh, I want to meet her. I want to meet her. I don't want to meet her. I don't want to meet her. And then on the flip side, the women are doing the same thing. Oh. I want to meet him. I want to meet him. And oh, then, and then you cluster them in an algorithm for different nights of the week. Exactly. Oh, now I get it. Hold on a second. Exactly. I can explain this idea. Okay. So everybody comes in. There's 10 events a month. Let's just say there's 10 events, events a month. You pick all the people you, you want to meet. Mm -hmm. The other people pick the people they want to meet. Whichever people get the most connections and hits, we group them together by the number of hits. So when you go to an event and there's 15 people at it, you probably had six or seven who wanted to meet you. Yep. And you wanted to meet six or seven of them, and because birds of a feather flock together, we're actually and so essentially one of the events might have people. Wow! Now that I think about this, wow! Is this? Are you stratifying beauty and attractiveness? You know, or desirability? I'd say desirability and compatibility. Oh, compatibility. Because we, we leave kind of beauty in the eye of the beholder in that sense. Sure. Because it's whoever you want to meet. Right. Okay. But every guy wants to meet beautiful women, so they're all going to pick beautiful women. And what if I'm like, like I know, uh, I'm pretty objective. I know I'm like a seven as a guy. You put uh -huh. in my personality, I turn to a ten. That's fine. Twelve. Maybe I'm a six and my personality <laughs> makes me ten and I average an eight and a half. Yeah. Whatever. I'm realistic about where I'm at. And I did fantastic in the wife sweepstakes. I won yeah. the lottery. So, um, but if all guys pick the top ten most beautiful women with the lowest cut dresses and whatever and the yeah. best bodies and the biggest smiles, what happens? They just they, everybody wants to go to the event with the top ten most beautiful women. Yeah. How so, do you so, handle that? So what we found is that there are different um, there are different things that men, both men and women, look for. Mm. Number one is picture by far, you know, for for both for both men and women though. You oh, know, a really? guy could have the best background in the world, submits a not so desirable picture, gets turned down. Really? We actually wow. done some blind studies where we didn't allow people to see the picture first. They're uh -huh. based on background. And then the woman would change their votes, like, oh, this guy's a 9 or 10 based on his background. Then they'd see the picture, boom, I don't want to meet him. <gasps> whatsoever. Yeah. Wow. Now yeah. there is a lean startup yeah. move. Yeah. So we actually just said, okay, first thing is picture. So we're just going right. to focus yeah. on the picture why, first. Why, why fight against the fact that we're naturally attracted to each other and yeah. different people? And then go from background. But what we found is that people are uh, – we definitely have some members that just sit there and just, I just want to meet her, I just want to meet her, I don't want to meet anyone else. Uh. And if the women don't choose them, they're, they're never really invited to an event. <gasps> Yeah. So you have to be realistic with yourself. Yes, you do. In a way. Yeah. You can and you have to know where you're at. Yeah. So a guy like me, who's essentially his game is based upon his cleverness, his ability to make people smile and laugh, this is not good for me. You know, it can't be good. We've, we've expanded our events to include also different types uh -huh. where there's like general member events where you go in right. and you can just, in that way prove yourself, I guess. Mm. See, I want to be. I want to where I can put a one-liner, or I can, you know, yeah. put a clever thing. You can do all that. See, if I put something clever in, I might get points for that. Yep. So there's picture and profile. So there's like. See, what I would do is I would just be straight up with my profile. My title would be: Listen, I know I'm a seven, but <laughs> I'm going to make you laugh ten times a night for the rest of your life. And you would get chosen. That's it. See, I got chosen. so much game, and I'm so out of the game. So you guys should probably think about that. I and need, put it on this profile. is what I need to. This is going to be my startup idea. Okay. I'm going to sell a service. Where guys without game can take out their phone and press the game button, and then it immediately dials me. And they just explain the situation they're in, and I give them game. Would you pay for that? You know <laughs> I have game, but he's got <laughs> tremendous game, Tyler. Did but do I not have game? Yeah. Even though I'm yeah. out of the game, yeah. I still have game. Yes. For sure. But the do I, do I really? I'm a little insecure about it <laughs> after 12 of, years of being you, out of the game. The startup you just described is very much like Dan Martell saying clarity, by the way. It, what, and how so? Oh, this is you, like call. Yeah, call for an expert, advice. like experts yeah. exchange, yes. like that, an expert network. Real-time phone calls, though. Yeah, expert network. But I think that would be gr – or maybe I could just give the phone to the woman and I'll just say something clever and then tell, them, tell the woman that you told me to say it. Right, be back. I saw a startup pitch me on this one time on a text-based version of this. Let me explain something to guys right now who are listening. And when we do the Jason Nation show, this will be like a great episode. The number one thing with women, well, two things. One, you have to give them your undivided attention. And guys do not do that. Number two, they don't care what you do. They don't want to hear about your sales awards or the product you're building. That's incredibly boring. 
Talk about something else. Talk about them, talk about something else. But don't talk about your own business achievements. It's incredibly boring for women. Mm. And make them laugh. My God, mm. I can tell you, I would go to bars in Manhattan, supermodel guys who are a foot taller than me. I'd have three supermodels around me, gorgeous girls, because I, I can make them laugh. God, if you can make a girl laugh and make them smile the way I'm making Steve laugh, smile mm. right now. Oh, oh. <laughs> Look, Steve is in love. No, seriously, Steve. They do have Starry those events, glassy, by the way. Yeah. Exactly. If you can make a girl, it's true, right? If you can make them laugh, you, yeah. you got a pretty good shot. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because we, the stats that we've done from the two years of events, we saw that taller guys generally get voted on more. Mm-hmm. But uh, the ones that did the best at the events mm-hmm. were between like 5'8 and 5'11 and a half or six right. foot. Right there. Normal. In that sweet spot. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'll tell you why. I think guys who are normal size like that, you know, yeah. who aren't like tall, yeah. they got to develop their personalities a little bit more. When you're a regular size guy or, God forbid, you're a shorter guy, you got to have a bigger personality in order to survive in the world, whether it's the schoolyard or prison or, yeah. you know, in the restaurant, anywhere. In, in a company, you got to have a little bit more. Like these tall guys, like whatever, you know, six foot, <laughs> who is it, Tony Robbins or something like that guy just shows up and smiles. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm six foot five and I've got a big smile. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. I'm here. That reminds me of. Oh, God. A double insight. Here we go. <laughs> Please don't let this involve midgets or dead babies. Go. British postage, Briti- British postage stamps. Okay, last time wow. We, we didn't get the jingle last time, by the way. You got to No, they did. They did. Oh, they did? All right. You were too busy laughing at it. British postage stamps. Yes. Okay. Why? What is the insight? I've pulled up British postage stamps pull up here. Pull a British post. Pull one up. Okay, here we go. What am I looking for? See the see the queen there, the yep. blue one. Yep. What doesn't it say on there? It, it doesn't say UK. Correct. Or? It doesn't say the country. It's the only country in the world that doesn't put the country on their postage postage stamps. Uh, so how you, brilliant am I that I got that? Do you know why? Because they ruled the world, and if we're sending it to you and you don't know who the queen is, you've insulted the queen. Correct. They invented Are it. you kidding me that no. I got both? Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. I am such a genius. Yes. <laughs> my, why am I not a billionaire right now? They're the standard. Can somebody explain this You're to on me? Your way. It's the same reason that the U.S. doesn't have to put I dot have... U.S. Dot CO on our emails. Yeah, of course it's us. We invented it. Yeah, we it's in- Oh, us. they invented postage. Yes. Right. And you need to respect our well, authority. Well, they're the standard. Yeah, of course. Right. That's so the tall sense. guy doesn't develop a personality a... because he doesn't have to. He, exactly. Yeah. Mundo. And you know what? I'll tell you something. A lot of the women who are tens out there, my wife excluded, they don't have great personalities either. Because they just, they're just used to sitting there so quiet, they just get as, too much attention for nothing. Then you go talk to them, they're brainless, some of them. I don't want to sweep with the white brush here. What you want is a girl's at eight and a half, nine. I think there are a lot of intelligent tens out there too. I, I like the ones who try to play dumb. Literally. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of that going on. And then you're like, yeah, where'd you go to school? And you're like, yeah, I just went to school. I had this one girl. <laughs> oh, this is great. It's one girl. She's very beautiful. This is long before Jade, and certainly not as beautiful as Jade. But she was literally three or four inches tall. I mean, she was like six foot or something, whatever, six one. And we're at dinner, and it's her first day. And I said, what college you go to? She goes, oh, I, I went to college in Boston. It wasn't exactly the question, but okay. We'll keep eating. Oh, really? Where, where was the college? Oh, Cambridge. <laughs> I said, oh, really? You went to college at Cambridge, Boston? <laughs> really? What, what college did you go to? She's like, yeah, just, you know, whatever. I, went for, I was, you know, a psychology degree or whatever. I was like, we either went to MIT or Harvard. Yeah. And what, we just, we just get out with it? And she went to Harvard. She didn't want to say she went to Harvard. And I was just Some like, people leave it off their profiles, actually. Oh, they hate. I mean, people yeah. from Harvard, I can tell you, because my um, sister in law, Joyce, is very brilliant. Uh, and she's doing Simple Honey. You know Joyce, Kim? Simplehoney.com. It's Not sure. incredible. Yeah. Great site. She just, just launched. launched yeah. yeah, doing phenomenal. She's very brilliant. She did Sumpy before that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. really great entrepreneur. And she went to Harvard. And I can tell you, my other friends who went to Harvard, they never say they went to Harvard because people hate. You could say you went to any college. You, mm. Oh, where'd you go? You went to Yale? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, what's it like? Oh, where'd you go? Oh, you went to Brown? Brown, oh, that's cool. Yeah, cool school. Yeah, no, no. Where'd you go to Harvard? F you. <laughs> Kill yourself. You went to Harvard? Like, everybody hates everybody who went to Harvard. It's just like wow. something. Did you go to Harvard? I did not. Berkeley. Oh, you went to a hippie school. That's cool. He's like, yeah. you go to Berkeley? He's like, oh, yeah, Berkeley. Yeah. You know why? 
You know why people are cool with that? Why is that? Because they think, like, I might have had a chance of getting... I know Berkeley's super competitive, but yeah. I might, in, on my best day, have a chance of maybe being considered to go to that school. Mm. Everybody else in their heart knows they're never getting into Harvard. Not a chance, right? You've been trained. <laughs> you are. If you said, I want to apply to Harvard, people would just be like, no, you, you don't want to apply to Harvard. You'll never get in. You don't want that heart-crushing experience. Why would you waste your time? What's, I'm missing the... Where, where, we got off track here. We're just talking about people's background, people's and, background and, yeah. and game. And anyway, this has been an hour and twenty-four minute episode. You were telling a story yeah. about a girl you went on. A I date just told with. you what I was trying to explain <laughs> to you is that some that you, 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 we, we somehow got into girls who play are, dumb, who play dumb. And it, there was another thing actually in New York City. Uh, it was called uglying up. And I used to work in Union Square, mm. and Union Square had Wilhelmina Modeling Agency, Elite Modeling Agency, both on Twenty Third and Twenty Second. I worked on Twenty Third. And then, um, what's the other big one? Ford modeling agency. It was on 5th and like 16th yeah. Street. I know because I had fr- I worked in the building of Wilhelmina, and Elite was around the corner next to a restaurant. They had a big sign outside. And then I, um, I had met Katie Ford a bunch of times at different events, and she had events at her place mm-hmm. on 5th. So all three modeling agencies, all in Union Square. And you would walk around Union Square, and it was like living in the Amazon. Like, or not the Amazon. What, what's the place where all the tall women are from? Amazon. Right. Amazon women, is that what they call it? Like the fictional... Amazonian. The yeah. fictional, yeah. you know, yeah. Amazon Amazonian. planet, Amazonian women, right? Yep. It was just ridiculous. And they would basically dress with baseball caps, hair messy, you know, ugly shirts, yep. like baggy sweatpants, like intentionally do what was called uglying up so that mm. they didn't, weren't, didn't have to walk down the street and make, make everybody's head snap in that area. And I have to say, you know, now that I think about growing up in New York, and now that I have a daughter, like, who are these guys on construction sites saying foul things to women as they walk by? Oh. God forbid I'm walking behind my daughter and she's graduating or going to NYU and one of you construction workers say that, I will jump over the fence and punch you in the face. Yeah. I swear to God. <laughs> I had a really funny thing happen last week with a very tall girl. I was in leaving a Whole Foods in the elevator. You have to go down to the garage. Yeah, sure. We get in the elevator. She followed you or you followed her? I'm in the back of the elevator. Okay, so she followed you. So you may have followed me. This is an important point. And she is very tall, 6'1", incredibly fit, super... Well, it's L.A. Very model-esque. So much so that in... And there's not models in L.A., I'll be honest. It's not... There's attractive women, but they're not right. model-esque. Right, right. right? This York is thing. very model-esque. Yeah, it's weird here. Yeah. And so two other guys get in the elevator, door closes, and one of the guys is borderline obese, and, but very tall, and, and turns right to her, right as the door closes, and says, Are you losing weight? And I don't know the relationship of these two people. What? Yeah. And he, like, right in her face, are you losing weight? And oh, wait a second. I, is this a joke? Like, is there a punchline coming? No, no. Is this like a pickup line? I don't know what's going on at this point. That's, that's somebody's going to get smacked. Go ahead. Right. And she turns, she looks at him and goes, yeah, did you, can you notice, can, can you see, did you notice? And he goes, oh, yeah, but you're doing something about it, right? Like, you're dieting, right? And she goes, oh, yeah, I just puked in the, I just puked. Don't worry about it. Everything's good. <laughs> oh, so she's just being sassy to him? Or you, he was trying to make her feel oh, bad. Oh, she being, just put him in his place oh my, like I, the I, little I, troll he was. Yes, and I'm in the back of the elevator. Laughing. I went into hysterics laughing. Oh, uh, that's good. That's nice to see a woman stand up for herself oh. and the little that. And I high-fived her on the way out of the elevator yeah. and said, good move. What a D-bag. <laughs> well played. All right. Everybody go check out Screen Date and go for a screen date. Still in beta. Are you on AngelList? You're raising around? We will be on AngelList. All right. Um, hmm. We haven't started raising around yet. Considering I have such massive game and no way to use it, I might be. I might invest in this. This could be something where I could be of value to you. Thank you very much. With all my gaming insights. Yes. Congratulations on Screen Date. Looking for it on AngelList soon. Everybody go to 5A5 Steakhouse. It is amazing. And uh, follow Steve, A5. The letter A, the number five, Steve, A5 Steve on Twitter. And uh, go check out goplanet.com. And if you want him to angel invest in your product, you heard what he's looking for. Passion, user interface, a big problem for you to solve. Some general level of intelligence. Statistics performance don't hurt. Your character is of the utmost importance. And a founder product fit, of course, critical. These are incredible insights that you've made. Much better than Tyler's two insights. Although I do like the British stamp one. That was pretty good. I give you credit for that one. I like that one. It was a good one. You did good, Tyler. It makes up for some of the obscene, offensive ones that you've done of late. 
I like to see you're cleaning up your. No, he's just been like on this like weird like. It's like I only heard a couple of them. Oh my god! <laughs> Somebody's gonna make a website with all of them at some point. It's gonna be like a, somebody should make a back to back. I, I command one of the uh, super fans. Watch this. I can just do this. It'll uh -huh. be done in like two days. I command a super. Like, it's, it's like I'm a Greek god. I'm like a demigod. <laughs> you are Greek. I am Greek. I'm, but I'm like a demigod. I can just be like. I command that somebody make a back-to-back -back reel of 10 of their favorite Tyler insights. And in f I can't do it immediately like Zeus. Mm -hmm. It'll happen. <laughs> but it could happen yeah. like Hercules. <laughs> It'll happen in three or four days. Somebody will get it done. Hey, uh, thank you so much to uh, Trotta and everybody Thank at Trotta and at Squarespace on their Twitter accounts. This has been an amazing long episode. Make sure we put in the notes that we talk about Steve's new company at the end, not the beginning, so people know. And everybody knows, whenever you watch the program, start at minute 50. If you've only got like <laughs> 10 or 20 minutes, I always hold the best questions for when I've got the, like a snake charmer, I get those guests right into the comfort zone, then I ask them the best questions at the end. Because they're comfortable. You feel very yeah. comfortable answering questions. You wouldn't, you wouldn't answer that question of the worst behaved customer to anybody but me. That would have been challenging. Or the open table. You were very, this, you were very open at yeah, open table. You're a little nervous about that. I was trying to remember what I can actually say and not say. Right, because they got you on. They got you on an ironclad. Yeah. You didn't mention the exact numbers. I did not. You don't want to get a call from the big draconian open table. Uh, I said that, not you. Yes. You just nodded and uh, gave me a Smiled. wink. He just smiled and winked, and he, he made like a choking death symbol as he mentioned open <laughs> table. He said, like, killed open. No, he did not. Open like table is great. Yeah. yeah, we like open table. They open table, yes. Yeah, I think people complaining about open table is like um, people complaining about free money. No, no, no. It's like, uh, give me one second. I know, because it, it, I know that it's like a perfect insight. It's like a teeing up it, a gorgeous. It, it's like patenting a nuclear weapon. Insights from Tyler. This has been an amazing program. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups.